We don't have much time. The problem is there are a lot of unknowns. We don't know right. how fast those will come and we don't know how risky they will be. The CEO of one of the most powerful AI companies in the world, Demis Hassabis, the mind behind Google DeepMind, sits down for an interview with Wired and drops a massive bombshell. The kind of revelation that has the tech world buzzing. The interviewer cuts straight to the chase, asking the exact questions everyone's been dying to ask. But before we get into it, Quick favor, if you haven't already, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. We're dishing out the hottest updates in AI and tech, and you won't want to miss what's coming next. Now, let's hit play and dive into the moment that's got everyone talking. Well, some of your peers are saying two years, mm -hmm. three years, and um, others say a little more, but that, that's really close. That's really soon. How do we know that we're that close? There's a bit of a debate going on at the moment in the field about definitions of AGI and, and then, of course, dependent on that, there's different predictions for when it will happen. Uh, we've been pretty consistent from the very beginning and actually Shane Legg, one of my co-founders and our chief scientist, you know, he helped define the term AGI mm -hmm. back in, I think, early, you know, 2001 type of time frame. And we've always thought about it as, you know, a system that has the ability to exhibit sort of all the cognitive capabilities we have as humans. And the reason that's important, the, the reference to the human mind, is the human mind is the only existence proof we have, maybe in the universe, mm -hmm. that general intelligence is possible. So if you want to claim sort of general intelligence, AGI, then you need to show that it, it, it generalizes to all these domains. When asked what it would take to truly have it, to reach AGI, he didn't hesitate. When every box is checked, when every gap is filled in, that's when we'll know, he said. That's when we'll have it. But then came the real insight, the moment he pulled back the curtain on AI's current limitations. He acknowledged the awe-inspiring power of today's large language models. Yes, they can reason, they can assist, they can even solve international math Olympiad problems with the precision of gold medalists using advanced proof systems like Alpha Proof. But here's the twist, those same systems. Sometimes they still stumble on high school math or miscount the number of letters in a word. That kind of inconsistency, he argued, is a clear sign. We're not there yet. Not at AGI. Not while reasoning, planning, memory, and genuine creativity still have glaring holes. When everything's filled in, all the, all the check marks are, are, are filled in, then we have it. We, it's... Yes, so I think there are missing capabilities right now, you know, that all of us who've used the, the latest sort of LLMs and chatbots will, will know very well, like on reasoning, on planning, on memory. I don't think today's systems can invent you know, true, do true invention, you know, true creativity, hypothesize new mm -hmm. scientific theories. They're extremely useful, they're impressive, um, but they have holes. And actually, one of the main reasons I don't think we're, we're at AGI yet is because of the consistency of responses. You know, in some domains, we have systems that are, can do international mass Olympiad math problems, uh -huh. you know, to gold medal sure. standard uh, with our alpha proof system. But on the other hand, these systems sometimes still tri trip up on high school maths or even counting the number of letters in a word. Yeah. So that to me is not what you would expect. That level of sort of difference in performance uh, across the board is, 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 you know, not consistent enough for, and therefore shows that these systems are not fully generalizing yet. He then described what crossing into AGI would actually feel like, not just a breakthrough, but a phase shift. Once all the check marks are ticked, he said, everything changes. Suddenly we have a system that can do everything. But would that shift be a flick of a switch or a slow burn? That, he admitted, is still up for debate. Some think it'll be a dramatic step function, a moment where the world changes overnight. But his own instinct, he leans towards something more incremental, even if we did build such a system. But when we get it, is it then like a phase shift? That, you know, then all of a sudden things are different. All the check marks are checked. Yeah. You know, and we have a thing that can do everything. Mm. Are we then pow in a new world? I think, you know, that again, that is debated and it's not clear to me whether it's going to be more of a, 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 a kind of incremental transition mm -hmm. versus a, a step function. My guess is it looks like it's going to be more of an incremental shift. Even if you had a system like that, the, the physical world still operates mm. at the, in the, in, with the physical laws, you know, factories, robots, these other things. So it'll take a while for the effects of that, you know, this sort of digital intelligence, if mm -hmm. you like, to uh, really impact, uh, I think, a lot of the real world things. Maybe another, you know, decade plus. Mm. But there's other theories on that too, where it could come faster. Eric Schmidt, formerly of Google, once put it in stark terms, AGI is binary. 
In his view, if a country like China gets it first, even by ten minutes the rest of the world is cooked. Why? Because that small head start could snowball. AGI could rapidly self-improve, widening the gap into a chasm no one else could ever cross. But not everyone's convinced. When that idea was brought up in conversation, the response was more cautious. That's just one possibility, he said. One of many. Eric Schmidt, who I think used to work at Google, hmm. uh, has said that it's almost like a, a binary thing. He says if, if China, for instance, hmm. gets AGI, then we're cooked. Because hmm. if someone gets it like 10 minutes before you know, the next guy, then you can never catch up, mm. you know, because then it'll maintain bigger, bigger leads there. Mm. You don't buy that, I guess. I think it's an unknown. It's one of the many unknowns, which is that, you know, that's sometimes called the hard takeoff scenario where, you know, the idea there is that these AGI systems, they're able to self-improve, maybe code themselves, future versions of mm -hmm. themselves, that maybe they're extremely fast at doing that. So what would be a, a slight lead, let's say, you know, a few days could be could suddenly become a chasm mm -hmm. if that was true. But there are many other ways it could go too, where it's more incremental. Some of these self improvement things are not able to kind of um, accelerate in that way. Uh, then you know, being around the same time uh, would not make much difference. But it's important. I mean, these issues on the geopolitical issues. I think the systems that are being built, they will have some imprint of the values and the kind of norms of the designers and the culture that they were uh, embedded in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think there, it is important, these kinds of international questions. Just a few years ago, the tech giants were practically begging for regulation. Please regulate us, they said. We need guardrails. But now, at least in the U.S., the narrative has shifted. The current administration seems more focused on speed, on outpacing China, than on slowing down to build safeguards. So the question was put directly, are you still calling for regulation, or have we missed the moment? His answer was calm, but layered. I, I think, um, you know, and I've been consistent in this, I think uh, there are these, uh, you know, uh, other geopolitical sort of overlays that have mm. to be taken into account. And the world's a very different place to, you know, how it was five years ago in many dimensions. But there's also, you know, I think the idea of smart regulation that makes sense mm. around these increasingly powerful systems, I think is gonna be important. I continue to believe that. I think though, and I've been sitting on this as well, it sort of needs to be international, which looks hard mm -hmm. in the moment in the way the world is working because these systems, you know, they're gonna affect everyone and they're, they're digital systems. Yeah. So, you know, if you sort of restrict it in one area, that doesn't really help in terms of the overall safety of these systems getting built, you know, uh, uh, for the world. Um, and as a society. Yeah. So that's the bigger problem, I think, is some kind of international cooperation or, co or collaboration, mm -hmm. I think, is what's required. And then smart regulation, nimble regulation that moves as the knowledge about the research uh, becomes, mm -hmm. you know, better and better. The interviewer didn't mince words. That all makes sense. But if the timeline is that short, then we don't have much time, do we? No, he replied without hesitation. We don't. He spoke with a sense of urgency but also determination. We don't, we don't have much time. I, I mean, we're increasingly putting resources into security and um, things like cyber um, and also research into controllability mm. and understanding of these systems, sometimes called mechanistic interpretability. You know, there's a lot of different sub branches of AI. Yeah, yeah. That so I are, want to get to interpretability. Yeah, that yeah. are being invested in. And, and I think even more needs to happen. Um, and then at the same time, we need to also have uh, societal debates more about institutional building, how do we mm. want governance to work, how are we gonna get international agreement, at least on some basic principles mm. around uh, how these systems are used and deployed and, and, and also built. When the conversation turned to work, jobs, livelihoods, the marketplace, the question hit with weight. How much do you think AI is really going to change the way people work? What about the effect on work, mm. on the marketplace? Yeah. You know, how much do you feel the AI is going to change mm -hmm. people's jobs, you know, the way jobs are distributed in, in the workforce. I don't think we've seen, my, my view is if you talk to economists, they, they feel like there's not much has changed yet. You know, people are finding these tools useful, certainly in certain domains, like yeah. things like AlphaFold, many, many scientists are using it to accelerate their work. So it seems to be additive at the moment. We'll see what happens over the next five, 10 years. I think it's, there's gonna be a lot of change 
with the jobs mm. world. But I, I think as in the past, what generally tends to happen is new jobs are created that are actually better, that utilize these tools or new technologies. What happened with the internet, what happened with mobile. Mm. We'll see if it's different this time. Yeah. Obviously, everyone always thinks this new one will be different, and it maybe it will be. Um, but I think for the next few years, it's most likely to be, you know, we'll have these incredible tools that supercharge our yeah. productivity, make us, you know, um, uh, really useful for creative tools and, mm. and actually almost make us a little bit superhuman in some ways mm -hmm. uh, in what we're able to produce um, individually. So I think there's going to be a kind of mm. a, a kind of golden era of the next mm. period of what, what we're able to do. The follow up was sharp. But if AGI can do everything humans can do, wouldn't it eventually take the new jobs too? That he acknowledged is the question, the one hanging over every conversation about AGI. He didn't deny the possibility. Well, if AGI can do everything humans can do, then it would seem that they could do the new jobs too. That's the next question about like what AGI uh, uh, brings. But, you know, even if you have those capabilities, there's a lot of things I think we won't want to do, you know, with a, mm. with a machine. You know, I sometimes give this this example of doctors and nurses. You know, mm. uh, maybe a doctor and what the doctor does and the diagnosis. You know, one could imagine that being helped by a AI tool or mm -hmm. or even having an a an AI kind of doctor. On the other hand, like nursing, you know, I don't think you'd want a robot to do that. I think mm. there's something about the human empathy aspect of that and the care and so on that's particularly uh, humanistic. I think there's lots of examples yeah. like that where, but it's going to be you know, a different world for sure. When asked what advice he'd give to a fresh graduate, someone just stepping into the world in the age of AGI, he didn't hesitate. His advice, simple but powerful. If you're, you would talk to a graduate now, mm. what advice would you give to keep working yeah. through the course of, of a lifetime, yeah. you know, in the age of AGI? My, my view is, currently, and of course this is changing all the time with, with, with the technology developing, but right now, you know, if you think of the next five, 10 years as being um, the, the most productive people might be 10x more productive if uh -huh. they are native with these tools. So I think kids today, students mm. today, my encouragement would be immerse yourself in these new systems, uh -huh. understand them. So still, I think it's still important to study STEM and programming and other things so that you understand how they're built Maybe you can modify them yourself mm. on top of the models that are available. There's lots of great open source models and so mm. on. And then become, you know, incredible at things like fine tuning, system prompting, mm. you know, system instructions, all of these additional things that anyone can do and really know how to get the most out of those uh, tools and do it for your, you know, your research work, programming, things that you're doing on your course. And then come out of that being incredible at utilizing and those new tools for whatever it is you're going to do. And so as we stand on the brink of one of the most transformative eras in human history, the message is clear, not one of fear, but of readiness. AGI is coming. The timeline may be uncertain, the challenge is vast, but the opportunity, extraordinary. The world is about to change, fundamentally, irreversibly. But that doesn't mean we're powerless. In fact, the opposite may be true. For those just starting out, for graduates, builders, dreamers, the tools of the future are already here. The invitation is open. Master them. Understand how they work. Use them not just to adapt, but to shape what comes next. Learn to speak the language of machines, not to become one, but to amplify what makes us human. Because in the age of AGI, the edge won't belong to those who resist the wave. It will belong to those who ride it with curiosity, creativity, and courage. The future is not waiting, and neither should we. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.